This morning, we're going to be back in Matthew chapter 15, and the title of the message is The Heart of the Matter. Let's pray. Lord, um, I ask just right now that our hearts would just be open to you, open to your word, open to what you and you alone have to say. And Lord, I just, I just want to pray even right now before we get into the word, just against any uh, burdens that aren't from you. And Lord, that we wouldn't carry those burdens that aren't from you, Lord, but that we would look to your word in order to decipher and discover what you want from and for our lives. And so God, as we look into your word and we um, just see the way that you walked out your ministry, may we too uh, take heed to get to the heart of the matter always. So Lord, that we can follow you to the full. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, after about nine years of washer and dryer success, ours finally failed. They had told us at the time that they didn't last like they used to. You see, Kathy's parents have had theirs for over 30 years. Ours went a good long stretch of nine and then they went down. And so we had to kind of find the perfect one. It had to be the right timing because we wanted to find one that was on sale. And so we found the perfect set. We found the perfect sale. It was just going to be about five weeks until they arrived. And so in the in-between time, of course, we were uh, spending more time with certain relatives than we had um, in... in (laughs) in previous months uh, while we got our our laundry done. And finally they showed up and we were so excited when they showed up. I mean, I'm telling you, we were watching every move and even the the guys who were loading it off the truck were coming uh, into our house. And I said, hey, we're just really excited about this washer and dryer. And I mean, Eli's jumping up and down. We're giving them cold water. I mean, it was just a, a really neat scene. Anyway, they show up and they run a cycle And so they headed out, but I was so excited that I watched the entire cycle. I wanted to see how everything was working and and hear the sounds. And about halfway through the cycle, I started to uh, pick up on something that wasn't quite right. I didn't know if it was a ringing in my ears or this brand new washer had a bad bearing. I soon realized that the brand new washer had a bad bearing And I went and had to break the news to Kathy that I think we were going to have to figure something out. We were going to be without for some time. So I called up the manufacturer. And when I called the manufacturer, they asked me to explain to them the problem and and to kind of run through the cycle. And I had studied up because I watched the whole thing. So I said, here's how it goes. And I explained to them everything that was happening. And once the water got into the drum, the drum would start spinning. And when the drum started spinning, then the bearing started singing. And... The person on the phone said, okay, so I think I know what your problem is. I said, oh, you do? Yeah, it's a really, I I think we can fix this. I said, what is it? She said, your water pressure is off. I explained to her um, exactly what I had explained to you. and, And I said, no, the water's already in the tub. And then it starts turning and the bearing is squealing. She said, well, I'm reading here technicians' notes that say nine times out of 10, when someone calls with an issue, it's due to water pressure. So what we need to do, our first step is to have someone come and reinstall it. I said, so you you mean like unplug the hoses and plug them back in? And she said, yeah. I said, well, I could do that. Okay, sir, can you do that? I said, well, I could do that, but that's not the problem. The problem is that when the drum is turning, the bearings are squealing. And she said, yes, but you see, I have written here these, um, these instructions that the technicians have given us. And on the instructions, it says, we're not going to do anything until we have it reinstalled. She said, so that's where we begin. And I said, no, that's where we end. Click. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do that. I heard her out. I wrote down the number and then I called back to another technician And that particular technician said, can you put your phone up to the machine? They heard the noise. All was good. It's all going to work out, y'all. It's all going to work out. But here's the deal. They were focused on a formula rather than the fix. 
And I think sometimes in our spiritual lives, we can focus on a formula rather than the fix, or we can focus on the things that maybe have been uh, put in place, the traditions, rather than the heart of the matter. And so here, as we go into Matthew 15, Jesus wants to draw us to the heart of the matter. These Pharisees had come in Matthew 15. They had come from Jerusalem and the Pharisees from Jerusalem had come in order to find something that they could pick apart in Jesus' ministry. You see, the book of Matthew starts out with Jesus' person being revealed and then his principles and then his power. We see his people sent out. We see his parables. In the last chapter, we saw him perform miracles as he fed a crowd of well over 5,000. We saw him calm a storm and walk on water, but through and intermixed with this all was a level of of persecution. The, The Pharisees and the scribes were coming against his ministry and they were pointing out problems with the things that he was doing and the things that he was saying. But the big problem with their doing this is that they could never pin him down regarding him not adhering to God's word. He always adhered to God's word. He followed it. In fact, in his own word, he said that not one I or T crossed would pass away until all was fulfilled. But there was some rules and traditions associated with the Pharisees and scribes. And so the Pharisees and scribes, after all that we have seen, come and find Jesus after they got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing more people. And the Pharisees come up and they find a way to pick him apart. And what they end up pointing to is unwashed hands. But Jesus would have none of it. Instead of focusing on unwashed hands, he wanted to get to the heart of the matter. If you would, please read with me in your Bible, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered them and said, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this, you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition." You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. After Jesus called the crowds to him, he said to them, hear and understand. It is not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of his mouth. This is what defiles the man. So this delegation of Pharisees that had come to speak with Jesus, who had come to pick him apart, they had come from Jerusalem. It was about 70 miles away from Galilee where he was presently. All of his interactions with scribes and Pharisees up to this point had been the Pharisees and the scribes in and around Galilee. But now this this delegation was coming from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where the temple was. It was where the finest schools in Judaism resided. And so it's almost this picture that we get of the Pharisees and the scribes had had several encounters with Jesus. They were trying to find ways to kind of knock him down or get people to stop following him, but it was not working. They had already fully and finally rejected him. And now here we see they call in the reserves. These guys were like the, the, the heavyweights of the Pharisees and the scribes. And they come in in order to prove him an offender against their tradition. People were beginning to follow him. Some were true followers Some were just curious and others like these scribes and and Pharisees were furious about Jesus. 
Regardless of their reason, whether they were there with good intentions or bad, Jesus continually pointed all to the heart of the matter, which was their heart in the matter. What was their heart toward the Lord? What was their heart toward him? And the core issue in these verses is centered on why a person does the things they do. Why do we do what we do? What and who do we live according to in our lives? And while these were the questions of their day, it's also the question of our day. What is our heart in our matters? What are we living according to? And so often our way can get in his way. Here they talk about traditions and the positions of men that that get in the way of them following fully God's word. The question then is, what do you do when your ways and your traditions get in the way of God's word? And I want to encourage you this morning that you can start by checking the conditions on uh, by checking the conditions surrounding your traditions. In Matthew 5, 2, Jesus says, Why do your disciples break the tradition? I'm sorry, Jesus didn't say this. The Pharisees said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And so This is important to understand. Jesus had followed the scripture, but he did not follow their traditions. The Jewish people at that time were guided by this tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders was found in this book called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah were oral traditions that were were passed down verbally from generation to generation. The Jewish people believed that, yes, Moses received the law of God, wrote it down on tablets. That became the word of God. But they also said that there were these oral traditions that were given and passed down that were equally, and according to them, if not more important than the scriptures. They added to that then a rabbinic commentary. So the rabbis then looked at the Mishnah, made their own interpretations, their own commentaries about that. That was called the Gemara. And the two of them together became the Jewish Talmud. So they had this book that was filled with the Mishnah, which were all of these oral traditions. Then the second half was, here's how you're able to live out all of these oral traditions. And it was rules on top of rules on top of rules rules. It's interesting because the Mishnah itself is quoted as saying this, it's a greater offense to teach anything according to the voice of the rabbis than to contradict scripture itself. Other ancient writings reveal uh, the heart behind that. Here's another quote. The words of the scribes are lovely beyond the words of the law. For the words of the law are weighty and light, but the words of the scribes are all weighty. And heavy and weighted were the words of the scribes indeed. It's why Jesus said in Luke eleven forty six, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. They had been weighted down with these rules. They had been weighted down with these oral traditions. And in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, we went over this a few months ago. Jesus said to the people who were listening to him teach, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Talmud was made up of 22 volumes of 563 books. In those books, there were 65 pages that were a that addressed washing hands alone. It was a ceremonial washing. And so before we think that, you know, Jesus was out there with hands that, you know, he never washed. No, that's not the picture that we should draw from this. The picture is a ceremonial washing. There was a ceremonial washing that would take place. So it's not about physical hygiene here. It's about following the customs of the tradition. There was a way, it was called the first waters. And the first waters, the way that they would wash their hands ceremonially was they would have these jars that were ready. And inside the jars would be water. 
but you had to have at least enough water inside the jar for one and a half eggshells. So the measurement was an eggshell. So cut an eggshell in half, fill it up, one, two, three, half eggshells, one and a half. If you had any less than that and you washed your hands, your hands would still be unclean. Now, it, wasn't, it didn't just stop there. You had to take that jar or someone could take that for you if there was someone there to help. And you would pour that onto your hand and it would have to drip down your hand and run off right there at the wrist. It had to drop off on the wrist because the water that was coming onto your hand was unclean. And so that unclean water had to drop off of your hand. And if you did not get it all the way down, your hands would still be unclean. You would have to do the whole thing over again. So these were the first waters. Traditionally, they were done before and after the meal. But then some people wanted to like kind of kick it up a notch. Like, oh, you guys do it this way. Oh, sorry, there was one more step. (laughs) See, I can't even remember this. You, You wash it that way. And then you had to take your fist of the opposite hands and do, and do that. And I guess that kind of was an agitator or something. It got, it got it. But then they said the first waters aren't enough. So then they came up with the second waters. The second waters were, then you would put your hands in a downward position, get the one and a half eggshells of water, pour it down. Because you see, when you poured it the first time, you're, there was unclean the waters became unclean and they would run off. So now it was clean and you could do it on the way back down. But if you got some from here, it'd be unclean. You'd have to start the whole thing over again. Now they were starting this before and after. And then some people who wanted to look like extra clean would do it before every course of every meal. They would ceremonially wash their hands and Jesus wasn't doing it. Jesus and well, his disciples, at least here, weren't, weren't doing that. And so this ceremonial ceremonial washing of hands, they were not adhering to or enforcing for one particular reason. It wasn't biblical. It was not found in scripture. There is nowhere in scripture where it says that you need to wash your hands this particular way for the common person. The Pharisees even acknowledged this in their question. When they came to Jesus, they said, what? Why do your disciples not wash their hands according to what? The tradition. Why aren't they following the tradition of the elders? There was nothing in the word of God that required this. It was just another burden that they were heaping on people and it was not God's heart. It was something that was done to appease traditions. And ultimately those one and a half eggshells and everything in the Jewish Talmud had people walking around on what? Eggshells. They were walking around on eggshells. And this was just one of many traditions. And we've talked about a few as we've been going through this gospel. The people were walking on eggshells. And Jesus was well aware of the traditions, but the conditions surrounding these traditions were man made, not God given. And Jesus was getting to the heart of the matter. And he addressed it directly. And the way that he addressed it directly was by responding to them with a question that would illuminate their heart in the matter. He asked the question in verse three. He says, why do, you and your, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Why are you going against the scripture? Why are you going against the word of God for your tradition? And he begins to highlight a truth that that should be highlighted, underlined, circled, underscored in the life of a believer. That is if tradition is contrary to God's word. If what's been passed down orally or what's been said is contrary to God's word, then that tradition is faulty. It's not God's word. We believe in something called sola scriptura. That means scripture alone. That means that scripture alone is is authoritative for our faith and practice. The Bible is the complete authoritative truth for our lives. And we should always know that in the things that we come up against. It's here that Jesus begins to open their eyes to the importance of checking the conditions of their their traditions. And he inspects their heart.
parts in the matter. And certainly we understand the value of inspection. We understand the value of understanding and canvassing the conditions of the things that we come up against. If you've ever purchased a used car, you know what I'm saying. I purchased a used car a few years ago and we were both really busy, myself and the seller. And so every time that I went to look at the car, it was nighttime. Yeah, big mistake because I went the first night, I went, took it for a test drive. Yeah, this is great. You know, they have these things on the ad, like it says new, like new, good, fair, or poor. And everyone puts better than it actually is. And so you get out and I'm looking at it and I'm not seeing anything wrong. It runs fine. And so I get the car or I don't get the car. I come back another night to buy the car. And I should have known because when I showed up to the house, he goes, oh, I just wanted to let you know that the side mirror over there is broken. Oh, okay, no problem. I'll get it fixed. It's not a big, it's not a big deal. And you know, when they say the condition of what it is, they have the chance to kind of tell you uh, why it's in the particular condition that it is in. But here was the problem. I saw the car at night. I didn't see all of the scraps or all of the scr scratches. I did not see all of the scrapes. I did not see all of the flaws. I didn't see everything that needed to be fixed. And so I bought the car. The next day I get home, it's in the driveway. I go outside and I saw it all. It was all illuminated. And I knew that I had some work to do on this particular car. That said, under the light of the sun, S, O N, the faults and the cracks and the conditions of the Jews were being illuminated. All of these things that needed to be addressed, all of these things that needed to be corrected, these conditions that, that, that were, were, were mere conditions and they were traditions were not right. Before you buy, sell, or trade, it's important to check the conditions. You may be buying a burden. And that's what the Pharisees were buying into and believing in. And that's what the Pharisees were putting on to other people, a burden. Later, Jesus would call the Pharisees and the scribes blind guides of the blind. But you see, Jesus was coming to illuminate the cracks. He was coming to illuminate the broken pieces. He wasn't about to put all of that back together. In Matthew 5 20, he had said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. What was he talking about? He was talking about a deeper heart level righteousness. And he goes on to spell that out in Matthew chapter 5. Ultimately, the people were being led to believe that they were unclean if they did not follow these traditions uh, and rituals to a T, but Jesus wasn't going to sign up or agree to those terms and conditions. He wasn't going to blindly do that. And we too need to consider what we put in place. And if it does not add up after being illuminated by God's word, don't sign up. John 17, 17, Jesus said that God's word is truth. Psalm 119, 160 to 161, the sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Other translations say all scripture is God breathed. Here, Jesus will point the Pharisees and the scribes back to scripture. And as you check and consider your paths as you check the conditions of your traditions, it's important you go back to scripture. What does it say? When someone wants to put something on you, you need to do it this way, or you need to do it that way, or it has to be this way, or you're outside of his will. It is always important to say, show me where you see that in the scripture. And if it's not there, then those conditions aren't checking out. Keep God's word first and you will make sure that you're not coerced into the ways of man so that you can continue to be undivided in your dedication. Jesus asked them this question. He says, why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? 
For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or mother. And by this, you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tra uh, tradition. He begins addressing what's going on with them by first quoting the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. It's the first commandment that has a promise associated with it. Honor your father and mother, your days will be prolonged. This is the commandment to honor your father and mother. And that commandment to honor your father and mother is inclusive of speaking respectfully, showing care and consideration. And it's not something that ends when someone turns 18. Honoring mother and father is something we do throughout our life. The scribes and the Pharisees knew the 10 commandments well. They could recite it from memory easily, yet they found a way to completely sidestep that command because of their tradition. Here was the tradition that the scribes and the Pharisees would put in place to circumvent honoring their father and mother. If you had something in your possession that was of great value, money or possession, you could declare korban over it. And this term korban meant dedicated. So you have something of great value, your possessions, the things in your home, you could say that's korban, it's dedicated to the Lord. And so once that item had korban declared over it, it was dedicated to God and nobody else could use it. But here's the loophole you could still use it. You could still use it, but it was dedicated to the Lord. And when you use that thing, when you put it back down, you would just say, Corban. But if someone else was in need or particularly your family or your friends or here, your parents, you could say, that's Corban. I, I can't do it. It's all Corban. <laughs> it's all Corban over here, pops. Just, Sorry. It is what it is. And sometimes people would even um, get out of paying debts by saying, that's Corban. It's dedicated to the Lord. It's Corban. I can't give it to you, but, but I can use it. Yes. And so the commandment of, from the Lord, from his scripture, was to honor their father and honor their mother, but they found a loophole. I wish I could help, but I can't. Yeah, I have two waters here and you're dying of thirst. It's Corban. And they're gulping it down saying Corban or something. But they were holding on to their tradition, giving the impression though, when they did this, that, that, that they had this, this great piety. They had this, this great just spiritual heart. It, it, it's Corban. It's Corban. It's all dedicated to the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And the parents, oh, you're so... You're so spiritual. I'll just die of thirst. I mean, seriously, like, that's what was going on. And so Jesus is, 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 is pointing them to the fact that they were merely devoted to their own devotion. They were merely just taking to their own tradition. And that's where it started and ended. The hope that they had was found in what, in what they could do or not do with their own hands. And that's a danger for us as well. The things that we can do in our own strength. Solomon, known as one of the wisest men who ever lived, said it this way in 1 Kings 8, 61. Let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments as at this day. Be devoted to the Lord, walk in his ways, place your life in his hands. Psalm 147, 10. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. But we have certain things, certain devotions, certain things that, that we 
look to in, in our life, traditional ways of doing things that if you don't do it this way, then you're not devoted to the Lord. If you're not walking it out like this, then man, you're going astray. One of those things that we actually find, there's some traditions in churches and I'm not gonna go too far down that, that path this morning, but I am gonna say that there's one really interesting one. So when we pray, most of the time we pray with our eyes closed. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says we need to pray with our eyes closed. There's nowhere in scripture where it says that. And so, in fact, the Jewish rabbis argued endlessly as to whether a man should pray with his head toward heaven, with his hands stretched toward heaven, or kneeling down on the ground. In the Bible, we see standing, bowing, uh, kneeling, walking, lying down before the Lord, but we never see particularly eyes closed. On two occasions, we see that Jesus actually lifted up his eyes to heaven when he prayed in John eleven forty one 41 and 17, 1. On the other hand, we see the tax collector in Luke 18, 13. When he prayed, he wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven. Uh, Tertullian, a church father, declared that we should never bow on a Sunday. Man should never bow on a Sunday. That is resurrection day. Man must never kneel. Sadly, that became a tradition and people stopped doing that. And so you're asking, why then do we do that? Well, primarily we do that because uh, it, it limits our distractions, the, the things that are uh, around us that we can focus and center our focus on the Lord. Certainly I do that with our three-year-old son because uh, if his eyes are open, uh, he's going to be all over the place. And if you're like me and your eyes are open, uh, you might be all over the place as well. It, it doesn't, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. But there are times when in church we'll say, hey, if you could bow your heads and close your eyes. And when I ask you to do that in the church, that's because people often are responding to the Lord. And we just wanna keep that between them and the Lord, just that, that, that knowing that the Lord sees them as they respond and just to respect that privacy. But uh, hands crossed, should we do hands crossed or hands open? Well, we're a hands-free church, okay? And so uh, you can do whatever you want with, with your hands, but, but we have to understand that if our hands are, are all over the place, those two are going to become a distraction. And so it's up to you. You just have to be careful with all of that. But here's the problem. I remember someone coming to me and saying, did you know that that person on your worship team keeps their eyes open? during the prayer. I said, how did you know? <laughs> well, I had something in my eye. No, they didn't say that. I just, I just said, how did you know? And they, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So here's the deal though. We have to be careful about those things and saying like, oh, they, they, they leave their eyes open. And so, you know, they're not as spiritual as, as I am. We have to be careful of traditions. Now, this is just one example, but there are many things like that. And what we have to do is continually go back to the Lord's word. Who are we dedicated to? Who are we devoted to? There are good traditions and bad traditions, but we can't let those things become inhibitions to our devotion to the Lord. Those things can become divisive and destructive, the center of our devotion. What's your position on this person or that person? Someone says, are you for, for, for Arminian or are you for Calvin? I'm Christian. I'm Christian, right? Like, well, well where do you lean? I lean on the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Like I lean on the Lord. And it's interesting because even uh, John Calvin in the days of the Refor Reformation, he preached power powerfully in this, uh, in this uh, cathedral in Geneva. He wore this felt hat when he preached. And so he would wear this felt hat when he preached. If you, if, even if you look it up, you'll see the John Calvin felt hat. And so he wore this felt hat when he preached. And so for a couple of years, he would always have this felt hat on. And the people would sit there. And over time, the men who were showing up to church would show up in what? 
a felt hat. And so they start showing up to church in felt hats. And one day he actually overheard two guys talking about whether or not you had to wear a, a felt hat when you went to church. And he comes up and one person said, no, it's not necessary. And the other one said, it's absolutely necessary. You have to wear a felt hat when you come into church. Isn't that right, Mr. Calvin? And he said, well, there's two reasons why I wear a felt hat in church. The first is, this is a large cathedral and it's a bit drafty. And the second, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but right above the pulpit is a family of pigeons. <laughs> and so I want to avoid what they can do to my hair. Anyway, look, it, it, it's not about this way. It's not about that way. It's about the way. And Jesus said that he is the way. Matthew 22, 36 to 40, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. They had started with a good thing, devotion. But in that devotion, it was rules on top of rules. And they were merely going through the motions, declaring things set apart, but they were really just playing a part. And Jesus actually says to them, you hypocrites. What were the hypocrites? The hypocrites in that day were the, the men who, or the, sorry, the people who were in the theater who wore actual masks. They were playing a part but it was not indicative of their heart. And in your life, the Lord does not want you to get stuck. Rather, he wants to start on your heart. He wants to start with your heart. This morning, right where you sit, when you come into the church, he wants to start with your heart. Where is your heart at? It's not about the way that you came in. It's not about the way that you were dressed when you walked in the door. No, it's where is your heart before the Lord? When we come into his presence, when we come before him, when we pray to him, when we do things for him, where is our heart? And he points out this big problem in their practice. And he says, you hypocrites. It says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Jesus said the heart of the matter was their heart in the matter. They were saying all the right things, but all of the right things didn't mean a thing because their lips were moving, but the heart was not responding. And, 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 and so often we can get stuck in the same place. Jesus actually said that in Isaiah 29, Isaiah was prophesying about them that their lips were moving, but their hearts were far from him. Their worship was in vain, worshiping based on appearances, not from their heart. They sang songs, they spoke about him, but their hearts were far from him. So too, while we claim to honor God, sometimes our hearts are far from him. And we sing the songs even in church and we read the words up there, but our heart is worlds away. And it's so important to do what Jesus told us to do in John 4. He said, worship, a day is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. Worshiping in spirit and in truth because Isaiah's words can so easily apply to you and I as well. True worship, Jesus says, must be in spirit. That is engaging the whole heart. I engage my whole heart into this. Whatever's in the way, whatever was yesterday, whatever was this morning, whatever was a few days ago, I'm gonna engage my whole heart in this moment of worship, in this time of worship. Unless there is a real passion for God, there's no worship in spirit. At the same time, worship must be what? In truth, that is properly informed. Unless we have knowledge of God, when we worship, there's no worship in truth. Both are necessary for satisfying, satisfying God-honoring worship. May that not be true of us. Singing the words of songs, but our hearts are worlds away from the Lord. The Lord wants to start with 
your heart. And his disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended by what you said? And they certainly were, but they needed to be. Because their hearts were going astray. And sometimes when we come in to the presence of the Lord, and sometimes when we consider our approach to the Lord and consider the ways that we go about that, we too need to be challenged. I wanna tell you something. When I come in, I mean, and worship doesn't just have to be when the songs are playing on Sunday morning, though it's a great opportunity for you to do so. And it's a time that's set aside for us to do so. But let me tell you, every Sunday, when we start the, the music and the service times, I'm looking for ways that I can stretch myself. Lord, I wanna engage my heart with you right now. I want the words that come up there to be meaningful and true in my life. And Lord, what would my righteous response be to that truth? We go from glory to glory. We'll never be the same. The fact that we can never be the same. The fact that the victory is won. The fact that he reigns. The fact that we can stand at the cross, surrendering our lives, owing our all to him, though he asks for nothing. What's our heart in the matter? What's our heart when we get before his word? What's our heart when we serve him? What's our heart when we do the things that we're doing? And sometimes the only way to change is when God gets our attention. And what he said is that these Pharisees are going to be rooted up. Something needs to change on the root level, the heart heartedness, because why? If we just stay on the surface, if we just pluck off the tops of the weeds, what happens? They're back within a week. And so we need to get to the root level. We need to get to the heart level. That's where we need to work is on our heart. And that's where he wants to begin. His work is on our hearts, not the place that we think he should start. Lord, I, I, I just wanna pray this way. Lord, would you just go deeper than we think you even need to? Would you go deeper than we even think you need to? Because you see it all. You see everything, the book of Hebrews says, everything is laid bare before you. And so God, may I be one who's laid bare before you and do as Roman 12, two said, not to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Then I will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. 